Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Retirement Success in Maine podcast. My name is Ben Smith. I'm joined by my two colleagues, as usual, uh, Curtis Wister and Abby Duty, the Doc Rivers and Pat Summit to my Brad Stevens. How are you guys doing today? I'm good, Hi, Ben. How are you? Doing well. Uh, doing well with uh, the, the intro, the analogies here. We're, we're talking coaches it was was the theme and we have a we have a coach with us today and really the thinking being is you know you know we've been talking a little about this concept of retirement and really this definition of what it what it is to lots of different people right and in uh, in in part of my conversations with with our guest today and in, in kind of this pre-chat is maybe what if we're thinking all about retirement all wrong right is what if really retirement isn't exchanging a binge on working for 40 years for a binge of not working for 20 30 years after that and really, many of the clients we talk to is they are in this mid to late stage uh, of their career, and they really may have already achieved a certain level of success, especially in their career, and they're really searching for what is next. But you know, th- and that's kind of that question is, but what is next for us? So this inflection point really leads us to start asking questions in our lives, such as, is this the right time to invest in myself and grow? Or is it time to exit something? Or is it time to change in our focus? So really, a lot of times, you know, we come to those points and we have those questions and we're really talking about this, this kind of change moment, but we really have a lot of trouble really articulating these questions. Sometimes it's really hard to share those, uh, those feelings with our work colleagues or even family members because they're not sitting in our shoes and really much less work to find the answers after articulating the questions. So really do that structural issue. We, we find enough of our clients really become stuck, right? Is they, 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 they know they need to change. They don't know what they want to change to. They don't know uh, what they want to do and how they want to change. They don't know who to talk to. So it feels like a very kind of solid prison that's happening there. So really this, uh, this concept that we're talking about today really is that life is a series of pivots where it really after each transformation, we've created the next version of ourselves, right? So it's, I think when we start thinking about transforming and in, in, in creating a new version, it's a different thing than retirement is a hard stop of career life. We got to change into leisure and that's the only kind of transition you can ever have. And that's the, that's the possibility. So we want to kind of talk about this idea of pivoting of one version of yourself to another. So our next guest uh, on today's show, she's an executive life coach and creator of the You Pivot program. And her clients have ranged from CEOs and C-suite executives for, uh, for Inc. 500 companies, Crane's Fast 50, Chicago Tribune's top 100 workplaces, and Crane's largest privately held companies. She's experienced uh, herself as a Fortune 500 company executive uh, with Northern Trust, and she's also coupled uh, her own successful pivot from the corporate world into entrepreneurship. And that has really shaped that unique perspective that she's bringing to us today. Every Sunday, you can also read uh, read some of her writing. She publishes stories about transitions of people that she's met and, and she's talked to, including sharing their life lessons from storytellers along the way. So you can read and subscribe to these Sunday stories on our website. So I'd like to welcome at this time uh, to the Retirement Success Main Podcast, Elisa K. Spain. Elisa, thanks for coming. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to our conversation. Well, Elisa, we want to all, all get to lots of things we do with you today. But of course, with uh, with all of our guests, what we'd like to do is just dig into you a little bit and, and understand your background and your bio. Uh, love to just hear about your kind of growing up story, right? Is is kind of where are you from and, and kind of getting into um, kind of the, these formative years as, as you were kind of uh, being born and, and going through school. I grew up in, in uh, Miami Beach, Florida, of all places. <laughs> mm-hmm. I actually went to camp in Maine, oh, outside nice. of, uh, in Naples, Maine. Mm-hmm. So I have an affinity to, to Maine. Mm-hmm. And, and when, did we, when did you go to camp in Maine? What were the years that you went to, you came here? <sighs> A very long time ago. I, I would have to do the math to figure out the years. But I mean, in regards to like, uh, like when I was seven or when I was eight or like what? Oh, what was the my age. Oh, yes. I thought yeah. you meant like the, the no, 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 no. I don't want to out you there. No. Uh, probably I went between eight and 11 or something like that. Nice. Were these day camps? Were these like oh, overnight camps? Play. Okay. Yeah. And, 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 and Mattapani in Naples, Maine. 
and oh, and yes. how long was the stay there? Was it a week? Was it a month? Eight weeks. Eight wow. Weeks. Wow. Ooh. So my parents were happy to send us away. <laughs> <laughs> so you had an immersive main experience. Yes, it was. It was and excellent. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place, man. Mm-hmm. Well, appreciate you bringing that up because it's always good to, you know, where, where people have sometimes this um, idea of what Maine is, but until you really have <laughs> been here, um, it's, it can be a little bit different than I think what people romanticize in their mind of, you know, the clean air, clean water, a lot of nature, which is all true, but there's lots of other sides to it as well. But uh, Elisa, so in terms of obviously growing up in Florida, you, you live in Chicago, kind of what was the, what was that path like? I moved here 40 ish years ago with my first husband. He took a job here. I always wanted to live in a big city. And so I was very excited to move here. And we lived in the suburbs. We compromised. He wanted to live in the country and I wanted to live in the city. So neither of us got what we want. We lived in the suburbs. And (laughs) then when we got divorced, I lived downtown Chicago for many, many years. And now I live in a close-in suburb called Evanston, uh, which is just right over the border from Chicago with my Second husband who I've been with for 30 years. Excellent. Well, that's great. Um, I'd also love to hear a little bit about your path towards becoming a business and life coach because, you know, I, I, you, you, it was pretty funny when we were doing our chat off, uh, off air in terms of our pre-podcast chat was, you know, we're talking about you were, you were actually had a, in a corporate career at Northern Trust and in kind of then kind of pivoting over to the business and life coach. I'd love to hear about your experience at Northern Trust, what that trend, what that pivot moment was for you uh, around saying, this isn't right for me and what's next. I'm actually going to start further back than Please. that yeah. because I actually started coaching when I was a teenager. Okay. <laughs> I was sort of like the, that Lucy cartoon. <laughs> I uh, had a, a a friend that lived down the block and he used to come to my window and and like at night and we would have these chats and I realized retrospectively that that was my first first coaching. <laughs> That's great. And I uh, I did do the, the corporate thing. I was, um, you, you mentioned when we talked this idea that you've observed that people that start left brain go right brain. And I kind of thought a little bit about that. And I, I think you're onto something there. So I'm ambitious and competitive. And so that the corporate path was a natural for me mm-hmm. um, until it wasn't. And it, I reached a point where I, I really, what I enjoyed most about management was the coaching part. And I realized that if I was going to progress in, in my career, I would get further and further away from that, becoming part of the C-suite mm-hmm. myself. And that just wasn't for me. So I pivoted to entrepreneurship uh, in my early 40s and still stayed left brain. I uh, was a consultant at that point. And then I discovered that I really had a gift for asking people the right questions to help them identify their genius and tell their story. And so I pivoted from consultant to coach when I started working with business owners. So I had been working with uh, more public companies initially, and then I started working with privately held companies. And I discovered with business owners that consulting and coaching kind of went together because their business and their personal lives were intertwined. And that's kind of how I got into the, the coaching world. And then um, I've always done a little bit of private coaching, and then I've been affiliated with um, a Vistage International, which is a CEO peer group organization for the last 15 years. And then about two years ago, I created the U Pivot program. Again, because I discovered that when people were at the point, as you talked about in your introduction, of wanting a change, nobody wants to go from the treadmill to the couch. Mm. And and a lot of people really struggle with, they, they know they, the, the three questions that, that you asked are the three questions you know, that I, that I asked um, my clients to try and start with. 
And what I've found is that they need some help in figuring out how to get from there. And there really isn't much of this kind of coaching specialization. And so I kind of fell into it working with the clients that I, that I had initially as an executive coaching. And I inserted the life, an executive life coach, because it's really helping them figure out how to live full lives, which often involves a transition. And I think that that's what was uh, kind of a eureka moment when we were chatting was, you know, here's, here's your kind of state of goal is again, helping people live a, their full lives and, and letting them realize that. And in one of the terms you said was identifying their own genius, right? Is, well, what sort of things really make you who you are and makes you the best of what, who you are. And I, I we really like that too, because I, I think from the traditional financial advisor lens, you know, I, I think where a lot of financial advisors just spend their time on a, a just working on money and finding one path to survive with money, and in it, what what we've been coming to on our conversation with our clients has been, well, geez, that there, it feels very empty. It feels very well. If I'm just showing you survivability money, well, isn't there so much more we could be doing to show you the path? of spending money that helps you realize your fullest potential and live your fullest life. And if we're not asking these questions ourselves or pu pushing our clients to those resources to do that, then maybe we're doing a disservice ourselves in terms of the work we're doing with our clients. So what, what I think we, we kind of saw back more, Lisa, was, was this, hey, I think there's a lot of really great overlap of the questions we want to be exploring, the, the work we want our clients to be doing, and how we want to push them towards that that, that, that place, right. Is, is there's that goal that we want them to get to. And which is why I think we started this show was, was reaching out to folks like yourself and saying, let's have these conversations about how we can push people to live their fullest life. And it doesn't mean they need to go all the way that every minute of every second of every day that they got to be living that life. But if they're experiencing more things all the time, they're going to be happier people. They're going to be, uh, their family's going to be, want to be around them more. They're, they're going to be more active in their friendships. They're going to just, not, they're going to fight a lot of these kind of things that we see as people go to the couch and they get lonely as their, as their relationships dwindle and they start fighting things because they're, they're sedentary and, and lots of things kind of kick in. So I think that's where we were going with this is like, Hey, let's, let's kind of get that. So I, I like that there is a good kind of uh, Venn diagram overlap that's happening with our, with our practices here. So I'd love to just hear a little bit more about your practice overall, because you kind of talked about going from uh, public to private, but who are your clients today? Like, who do you work with? Uh, what, you know, we talked about those three questions that you start asking them, but what, can you just walk us through that, um, the, the person that comes to you, what they're facing and how you help them? Sure. But let me let me start by saying, kind of building on what you were saying, that there is a natural affinity between what you do and what I do, mm. because you help them with the the financial side of what they do, and I help them prepare themselves. You help them prepare their their finances for what's next, and I help them prepare themselves. And often, the preparing yourself part is left out. Yes. One of the things that inspired mm -hmm. me to do this is a, a client that I met when he had his second business, he told me a story which really stayed with me. When he sold his first business, he went into a depression hmm. because he, he, he said he, he, the day they closed on the deal, he went home and he sat down in front of the television hmm. um, and didn't know what to do with himself. And, and then I talked to someone else who told me a story who's in Chicago um, who, who his life became the Chicago Cubs. He went to every single game and, and then he, and he was in his, his fifties and he woke up one day and he said, this isn't, and then they lost a game and he was depressed. Mm. And he's like, this, this, I, this, this is not working. I've got to <laughs> do something. And so there is an opportunity, as, as you said, you know, you can't often do it yourself. And I think the, the biggest reason why there's more demand for what I do is frankly, just because people are living longer. So mm -hmm. yeah. those are two stories of people selling businesses when they're a bit younger. We're talking about people who, who when you and I first talked, we used to talk about retiring. And I think today 
because that second part is so long, people are saying that they um, they want to do something with that time. Mm -hmm. And it's that figuring out of, of what that is. And because the people I work with are achievement driven people, often mm -hmm. uh, CEOs and business owners, mm -hmm. um, when they're working on themselves, they're just as driven as they, they are with their companies. They want to get started right away. Actually, I just got a message from a friend who is retiring mm -hmm. of the literally eight things he's now signed up to do. And what I do with my clients is I say, whoa, let's, <laughs> let's just start from the beginning and think about um, where you are, who you are, where you've been. And, and they all wanna go, like I say, because they're ambitious, driven people to, to the actions. Mm. And that's why I created this, this You Pivot workbook. So it walks them through a process of questions for them to answer. And typically each of the pages in the workbook is one of our sessions. So they'll prepare it for the session and they'll answer questions like, tell me your, your story. It's kind of like what you asked me, but in, in more, more depth, how you got to where you are. Mm -hmm. um, what drives you? What, what, if, what are your, what's your style? Um, those sorts of, of questions. And, and then what I ask them to do in the next phase, when we spend usually quite a bit of time on this one, is is what is and what matters. And I use a um, a wheel of life as the starting point for that. And so I ask them to draw it, and then um, as it is, and then what matters. And sometimes there's just tweaks between the two, but sometimes the the differences are significant. Mm -hmm. And so we will spend some time both on the size of the spokes or slices, as well as on the content of the spokes or slices. And then the third piece is, there, is the investment. So they may want a slice to be this size, but they're not, they're not spending the, the sort of um, effort to make it fully this size. Their, their effort is more here. And so, we spend a lot of time on that. And if, if they have a significant other, I ask them to have them do the same exercise and then create a Venn diagram. Because I, I like what you just did there, because what you've essentially done is created a gap analysis, right? Is saying, hey, here's here's your stated where you are today. Here's where you want to be. And there's the gaps of those of right. those differences. But also now with your spouse, and you could also start to identify relationship um I don't want to say issues, but maybe there's differences that may happen in those two wheels. And especially if we're saying we're pivoting to a new part of life and we, we now have different visions of what those pivots look like, you could see where people could also be growing apart as well if they're, they're not kind of reconciling those things. Yes. And in addition, um, sometimes what they believe their significant other wants or expects isn't. I mean, we talked mm -hmm. a bit, and I know we'll talk later about this idea of an unreliable narrator. It, it comes in in all parts of our lives. One of the clients that I um, have been working with, the story he told me, I, I, I say to him all the time, this, the, the wife in your head and the real wife I, don't sound to me like they're the same person. <laughs> Yeah. And, and yeah, I, I don't want to get to that a whole lot, right? Because I think that's a really, first, first of all, it's a really important piece that I think we, we hadn't heard from any of our guests so far. And I, I want to really dig into it. But um, I want to really go into this idea of life pivot here for a second, Elisa, is, is it really thinking about, because the topic of the show really is this whole thinking about retirement as a life pivot. Because you were saying to me the other day about, you're really challenging me on the label, and, uh, challenging in a good way, that, hey, you're using this label of retirement. And for a lot of people, this whole thing and this label of retirement really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So instead, you were using language like uh, career 2.0 or career 3.0 or life or life 2.0 or life 3.0. So there, there's new versions, right? And and almost like a new version of software or something that's coming out that you're, you're kind of have this, and I don't want to say upgrade, it's just different, right? Is it's just a different change. So can you 
just talk a little bit about um, the, just how, why do you refer to this part of life this way in rather than this kind of traditional language of retirement? I think it's, it's because, like I said, partly because that timeline is longer. And one of the questions I ask people in the, the first part is how, how much time do you feel like you have left? Mm -hmm. And that, that's a very interesting question because mm -hmm. how different it's answered by people of the same age. Mm. Interesting. And you ask that question also for financial planning. All the time. Yeah. And um, I don't think most people stop and think about it in terms of their, their how they want to spend their time. So, mm -hmm. uh, so the reason I, I came up with the versions is probably partly, frankly, because I'm, I'm into technology. Um, so I kind of think that way. And partly because of my own experience. So when I think back on my own life, I, I think about the early phase of, of my life and career as the version 1.0, not the starting with the career phase, not the childhood mm -hmm. part. So that would probably be a, a my, whatever point something. Um, so the, the first career is, is the 1.0. And then um, when I made my own pivot from the corporate world to the to entrepreneurship, that for me was 2.0. And there were uh, releases in between the 1.0 1, 1 and the 2.0 that you know, promotions and those sorts of things. So so changes within where you are. And then the, the gotcha. 2.0 is, is, again, there were changes from, from within where I was. So moving from consulting to coaching and the evolution of coaching. And so that's the way I look at it is that the increments, much like with software, within where you are, are still within the same range. But when you hit the, the 0.0, that's really more of a, of a, a trans, transition, a full, full transition of some sort. And it just, for me, it just works as a, as a language. And I found that, find the same with my clients it, because people, most, all my clients come from the business world. They, um, they just resonate with that, that thinking that way. And it was actually one of my clients that gave me the idea um, for, for approaching it that way. And then, you know, when I started telling you the process, once we get through the what matters, then they, they looking at each of their versions to, to ask them to kind of think about what's worked and what hasn't, and then start working on the vision for the next phase and ultimately write their, their tomorrow story and then, and then get to action. So really slowing down the process to prevent what my friend is doing because I know what's going to happen with him because I've seen it happen with others. He's going to, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I, what I try and do is prevent that. Um, so you touched on this just a minute ago about the importance of telling your story, right? And what is working, what isn't working, where you've come from, um, and, and how that really flows into your future vision of yourself. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about how you help people do that, um, how they get started and where they may be tripped up in that process? So the how really comes back to the, these sections that they, that they fill out that we then talk about. So mm -hmm. what happens is as people start to tell me their story of who they are, that helps me then when we get to the what matters, mm -hmm. because they may say X, Y, Z matters. And then I'll say, well, wait a minute, I heard you say this about yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me how that fits in and, and those sort of things. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a, like any other coaching, it's a questioning process to help keep asking the better questions so that they can reflect and, and think about how it, it impacts them. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's structure in, in the sense of the, this um, workbook and each person is different. Like with any other executive coaching, it's a process of asking a, lo a lot of questions to help people get to the better answers. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and Elisa, one thing I really like at the structure that you're kind of talking about here is this concept of a today story is that, you know, it's like, who are you? Where are you today? What is working? What isn't working today? You know, and th- that's where I, I think where a lot of the people we're going to is, or we see them in these pivot uh, moments that we know they're approaching that point. Oh, that they're getting to that point. It, it just, they're, but they're struggling. Right. And there's this whole, like there are things in their life that is working. They're very happy with. There's also other parts of the life that isn't working. And it's this, and like the, the solving of the, the, the isn't working part is kind of what gets them to that point. Oh, but you know, what you're saying is it really, you can't create a future vision if you really don't even know what is and is not working today. Right. It, well, it is and is not working today. And also what, um, who you are, what your characteristics are, what your personality style is. Most people have taken some sort of personality profile. Mm-hmm. If they haven't, I'll, I'll offer one to them. Um, and then I also ask people to read three books somewhere in the process. A, a couple of them I ask them to read first, which is um, Necessary Endings by Henry Cloud, which is a wonderful book that, that is very helpful in making decisions about endings, of which this is one. And then uh, there's another one called Transitions by William Bridges. Those are the two I ask them to to read up front so that we can talk about it as a language. And what Henry Cloud talks about in his book is this idea of pruning, that in order, he uses a rose bush metaphor, and and in order for a a rose uh, bush to grow, you obviously have to prune dead wood, but you also have to prune good buds and roses because for I didn't know this before I had a rose bush. If you just let it go, they don't grow. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the whole point that he's made is is this idea of of pruning and having endings um, so that you can have beginnings. And that's one thing I think is really important about this idea of transitions is so many people think of a transition as an end. I remember one, one, a friend of mine, when I first started this practice a couple of years ago, and I think I wrote my first blog about it, he said to me, well, how can you work with these people? They're unemployed. I'm like, not always. And it's a beginning. It's not an end. Right. And whether it's, it's a 3 or 4.0, for the people that I work with that are mid-career, it's obvious that it's a beginning. Mm. And for the three, four, three O's and four O's, it's also a beginning. Again, mm. because as you pointed out, your retirement life might be as long as your mm-hmm. work life. Mm-hmm. Sure. And then another book that I asked them to read at kind of midway is one called Positive Intelligence by Shirzad Shamin. And I've worked with his program of mental fitness. And they, uh, the whole premise of that one is that we all have these saboteurs, um, things like control and stickler, and, and there's, there's nine of them all together, and the ultimate one being our judge, that is what causes the stuck, is what I've discovered, what, what gets in the way of moving forward. So helping people, once they understand kind of where they are and what they want, then to understand what's getting in their way of forward motion. And that's, um, uh, Henry Cloud has a, has a great um, quote that I like for this. We change our behavior when the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. I like that, and that's really good. Consequences give us the pain that motivates us to change. And the, the challenge is with this, there, there may not be consequences. Mm-hmm. So how do you then understand where you're blocking yourself with your saboteurs? So I, I wanna take a second and circle back to something we teased a few minutes ago and that's the unreliable narrators. Um, that was a great job. Uh, you know, we teed it up a, a few minutes ago, it's great. Um, <laughs> so I guess I'll start with, uh, can you just kind of talk about the idea of an unreliable, unreliable narrator, kind of define it, what it is, um, how you've seen it present itself, um, you know, with your clients? I know you shared a, a small story a few minutes ago. Um, and then kind of the flip side there is how do we work as individuals to find, you know, the more reliable narrator 
inside us. Like, it's, you know, I'm assuming this is part of your, your process with your clients is, you know, you identify that unreliable narrator, but then how do you kind of get through it, get past it and kind of create this more reliable narrator? It's a discovery process. So I learned about unreliable narrator when I was in a book club years ago. Mm -hmm. It's a, a literary technique. Mm -hmm. And we've all read books like that, where you're, you're reading through the book and you're believing, 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 and then you get three quarters of the way through it and you realize it's all a lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, right? I mean, that's what makes, makes it exciting, you know, mm -hmm. often the case with mysteries and that sort of thing, mm -hmm. right? So that just kind of stayed in my head because I had not heard that term either. And, mm -hmm. and I've just begun to discover that that's something we do with our stories. And it's a discovery process. I had a client recently that I, I actually wrote, wrote a blog about him and he, he, he sent me an email after he saw the blog. He said, I, I showed it to my brother and we both laughed. <laughs> when I first met him and I said this to him, when I first met him, I, I thought, I don't know how I'm gonna help this guy because like, he's a loser. <laughs> and then I started asking more questions and learning about him and it's just the story he was telling himself because he, mm -hmm. he, he wasn't the image of a CEO that he, that he thought he should be, despite mm -hmm. how successful he's been and how successful he was in preparing this business for sale. Mm -hmm. Similarly with my client, uh, who the wife in the head and the wife in reality are two different people. So it's a discovery process. And I don't know how we can discover it ourselves, frankly. I think we need somebody else to, to ask us questions to help us realize it. Because that's why he laughed when he, when he read it. And that was a switch for him. Because as soon as he realized that he was lying to himself and his saboteurs were, were telling him these lies, then he could then start crafting his tomorrow's story. Even though he was really anxious to do that sooner, he really couldn't until he realized the lie so he, so he could talk about his genius and what his talents and skills are. So that he has now identified where, what he uniquely brings to the world. And it took this iterative process to get there and so while it works in fiction, it, uh, it works so well in our lives. And, and at least I'll, I'll kind of follow up there too is, you know, I think we even just kind of noticing amongst our team and just showing a little vulnerability here for a second is, is even just kind of looking at this and going, Hey, um, you know, I like, we do this podcast and go, well, Hey, I, I just do this piece of it. And you, when you say, I just do this piece of it, you start minimizing something and right. You start m minimizing a role you play and, and your importance of a team and, and all that. So I think that's where even even just from that conversation that you and I had the other day of you going, Oh man, I do that to myself all the time. Like I, I just say, Oh, I just do this or, Oh, we, we only work with these types of people or we, you know, when you start kind of creating your own barriers in your language, you express to people, man, I just go, oh, I do that all the time. And, and you go it, instead of kind of going more affirmative of, Hey, this is who I am. I'm really good at doing these things. Uh, and I really enjoy working with these sorts of situations, or I really enjoy that I'm one of three people that does a podcast uh, where we highlight these sorts of things uh, to our audience uh, and really get to meet great guests. You know, just flipping those things around, all of a sudden you go, if I was just telling that story to myself all the time, you know, but that story I tell myself is then what I express to others is what I was realizing from our conversation. So I, I, I really, really love, you know, that discovery that you're kind of saying about helping people find the unreliable narrator because I think we all do that a lot is I'm not I feel like I'm not worthy of something and I know uh, Amy K Hutchins was talking about that in one of her previous shows was we don't communicate things because sometimes we don't feel we're worthy and when we don't feel we're worthy then that's what we say too is we're not worthy of of love or uh, attention or to get the next job or I, I'm too old or all of those things kind of creep in so I thought that was a really you gave it a really great label as well, which yeah. I like. 
Thank you. And, and, and again, these saboteurs that I talk about are like build on each other to, to mm -hmm. continue to perpetuate that, that lie. And so, Elisa, what I want to get to as well is obviously you've kind of helped us identify a little bit your process in the today story, right, is, is kind of what that's like. But also, I think then the next part of once we identify the today story, the unreliable narrator, what we're telling ourselves, but then also getting to the tomorrow story. And I you know you just said, uh, hey, a lot of the clients you work with really just want to work on the tomorrow story. <laughs> and that's really it. But this is really the purpose of our show, right? Is to kind of get into this shining a light on possibilities. You know, I think in maybe the whole purpose of our show really is that we all have an unreliable narrator when we get to be 60 and older saying we're not worthy, we're not able to do things. So our show wants to kind of fight that a little bit. So can you talk a little bit about um, the tomorrow story? Because I think what, what kind of hits sometimes in our clients is that the tomorrow story they're telling themselves of what's uh, able is they, they think that their finances don't match that a lot and they use whatever reason, maybe it's finances, maybe it's I'm old, maybe it's I'm, they're telling themselves something which is blocking that tomorrow story from happening. Can you talk about how you've helped people write their tomorrow, tomorrow stories and where, where you see them get tripped up? So I'm hearing a little bit of a different thing in what you said. I, and the, that's kind of still back to the lies and the un unreliable narrator, like you said. And I think that's still in the early, earlier phases. Gotcha. Of kind of getting a sense of where I am and what matters. Because um, once you, once I get people to kind of under get clarity on on what matters, then what I ask them to do is kind of write their their vision for the next version of themselves, starting with uh, what version they think they're in, because much like the how long is your life, the version number is, is different for different people, even mm -hmm. at the same age. Uh, I have a client who is 65, who ex thinks he has eight years left. I'm 65 and I think I have 30. Yeah. Now, a lot of it's based on the longevity of our families, right? That's right. But we don't necessarily, my, my mother thought she was gonna die at 69 because my father died at 69 and she lived in 96. I kept explaining to her that they weren't related, at least hope not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so part of it is getting that clarity with, you know, your number of years and what version you think you're on. And mm -hmm. then, um, to kind of talk with them a bit about what paths they think are available to them, which ones they're considering. Um, everybody who is at this stage has a network. So figuring out what is available in your network, who's in your network, what opportunities might be there, um, what constraints you have, whether they be location or your perceptions to your point of your marketability uh, today, you know, what impact COVID might have, mm -hmm. um, what are your non-negotiables? Mm -hmm. So things like, I, I always wanna be available on weekends and, and evenings or you know those sorts of things, things that you're not willing to, to give up to get whatever you're gonna choose. And uh, income requirements, if any, and then I ask them to talk about what they're afraid of. And I do all, all of that stuff and we talk through all of that stuff. And I think the harder, hardest thing is kind of writing the tomorrow story. So I ask them to start by just making notes as they think of things. And then we will talk through it a few times before we get to the, the actions. And I, like I said, to me, the, the biggest difference between going through this process and the typical process is the pause of doing this in a structured order and not jumping right to the actions so that you, you make a better um, choice and a more focused approach to figuring out what the next version is going to be. I, I think it'd be helpful for me anyway, is to uh, hear a little bit of an example of that tomorrow story. So like if, because I think it'd be helpful to just go, here's an example of somebody that says, here's what um, 
what the outcome here is. What what is what have they drafted for themselves once they've gone through all the the paths, the the constraints, um, all of all of your process to go. Here's here's a story that they've written for themselves. So here's a, a good example. I have a client who uh, sold. He was not the owner of the business. He he had a small interest, but he he was a hot, hired CEO primarily. Mm-hmm. Sold that business and. In the beginning, we spent a lot of time talking about some of the the emotional side of of ending. Like, what do you put on your business card? When people ask you, what do you do? What do you say? You know, all that kind of stuff. And then um, we he then started thinking about going through the process of what matters and what what's important to him. And he what he he decided was that the his, his wife um, has um, stage four breast cancer, but she's mm-hmm. doing fine. Um, she's not fine long enough that they would call it remission, but she does seem to be doing fine. And um, so spending time with her is a very high priority mm-hmm. because they don't know how much time they have together. And he is very passionate about um, the value of the fraternity system at universities and in particular the university that he went to. He's done some volunteer work for them but it was really important to him to get involved with that because he expects that that's gonna go away because of all the terrible things that have been happening and he, he believes that he can make a difference. So that's something that he cares about. And he wants to stay connected to the business world. So he was trying to think about how he can do that in a way that doesn't interfere with the time with his, his wife and the time he wanted to spend in a more philanthropic way. And so he decided he wanted to become an investor in startup companies and then offer both funding as well as expertise to these companies. So. That was the tomorrow story that he ultimately wrote and then got, and it was all based on how he designed the spokes of his wheel of life. I like it. Because right, again, and, and then I, I could see where from a coaching perspective is now we're trying to realize that that tomorrow story. And of course, there's always some things that we envision in our head that maybe is not practical or realistic as we go to enact them, which probably requires more coaching in terms of da- adapting some of that story and continue to adapt the story as we go. Right. And that's where it's, you know, what that, that last part of you know, what, what's available to you, what are your opportunities it is important. Like a lot of, of um, executives when they retire want to get on boards. There's a lot more mm-hmm. executives that want to get on boards than there are boards. Mm-hmm. And the boards mostly don't have um, terms. And so, you know, people are 80 years old and they're still on the boards. And for a lot of reasons, that is just not realistic for most. Mm-hmm. So that would be an example of what you're talking about. Gotcha. Um, so recently you shared a story um, about a gentleman who said he flunked retirement twice. Um, so we really liked this. And so can you share with us that story, um, why it's meaningful? And do you think it is actually possible to flunk retirement? I thought it was a very interesting choice of words, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is why I made the, the title of the blog. Yeah. <laughs> so I think his so let me briefly tell you tell you the story and then I'll I'll give you my my thoughts on it. So he uh, had a very impressive career. He and, and most most of my uh, stories that I write in my Sunday stories are pseudonyms. But this is actually he, he was perfectly comfortable with disclosing who he is. Um, um, Marsh Carter is his name, and he he was in the military, um, was in the Marines, and then when he got out. He couldn't find a job at all, sent out 85 letters. Uh, And then somebody just did him a favor and got him a job at Chase Manhattan Bank in New York. And he went to work there. He sort of the classic story took the job nobody wanted. And that job happened to give him exposure to the chairman of the bank which gave him all kinds of opportunities. And he, he rose pretty well, which is when I met him 
um, to this new business that we both worked in called Global Custody. And he was tapped from that. I mean, he was a senior vice president, which is a, you know, a fairly high level position, but in a money center bank, there's a zillion senior vice presidents and it's pretty far from the top. And he was tapped from there to become the CEO of State Street Bank and Trust mm -hmm. uh, because of circumstances. And so he went into that uh, knowing he was going to retire in 10 years because the reason he got that opportunity was because the retiring chairman and CEO was grooming somebody for his position and six months before he retired said that he didn't think it was the right person. And so the board was left with finding, and he didn't say he was going to stay on. I'm still leaving in six months, but he's not your, he's not your guy. So the board had to find somebody in six months and they found Marsh and fortunately they made a good choice. So he went in knowing that he had 10 years because the board asked him, they said, There's, we're, we're not letting this happen again. So, you know, we need to decide up front um, when you're going. And he said, well, I think eight to 10 years is about the right time. So he agreed. And four years before that, that time was up, they started looking for his replacement and ultimately found him. And he passed the baton when he was 61. And so he retired, he always thought he wanted to teach and he became a, um, I'm guessing an adjunct professor at um, the Kennedy School at Harvard. And then when he went into a second year, he discovered it was, he didn't really like teaching because he didn't want to teach the same class a second time. So it was about that time that the, the leadership of the New York Stock Exchange kind of imploded because the um, then CEO was involved in a bit of scandal. So they just wanted to change everything. And so they wanted to bring in people who were, um, you know, uh, of, of utmost uh, regard. And so he was invited to be on that board as was Madeleine Albright and other people of that caliber, all of whom I think were retired. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they asked Marsh to become the, the chairman and CEO, which he did for 10 years at 65 is when he took that job. And then he finally retired for real, he said, sort of, <laughs> uh, at 75. Um, but he still teaches a bit and he still consults a bit. So I have a similar story from my uncle uh, who was always a role model for me. He, he got fired uh, when he, I think he was 75 or 80 he had been consulting with a, um, a company similar to this man I was talking about earlier who he invested in and was providing mm -hmm. advice to. And, and I forget what the circumstance was, but they needed his office. <laughs> so he, was, he really was quite distraught about getting fired, as he put it, but even though he was at, you know, Wong had been in an advisory role. So back to the Marsh story. So... Um, I think that if Marsh had gone right from State Street to the New York Stock Exchange, I think that wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. He needed that pause. And so mm -hmm. the, the teaching, this is my read. Mm -hmm. um, he needed the, the teaching opportunity was a perfect interim. At the time, he didn't know it was interim, but it, because it was, within, it was small enough that he could control it. Mm -hmm. and is something he could walk away from any time. I mean, obviously not at the middle of the school term, but it's only a one year commitment. So I think his story is a really good example of the importance of pausing mm -hmm. and not jumping into some large new commitment right away. And there's there's been some uh, quite a bit written on this topic too, a, a um, friend of mine uh, is an author of, of a book called uh, What Happens When You Get What You Want. Rick Eigenbrod is his name. And he's also um, wrote an article with Yale on this same topic. And they all, you know, all of us advocate, take some time. I don't believe you necessarily have to, like William Bridges in Transitions, he, he talks about that the ideal is to be in transition, which means you stop one thing, pause, before you start the next. 
I think that's appropriate for some people. I don't, I don't feel like it needs to be quite that black and white. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think for some people having something in the interim is a good idea, just as long as that something isn't the next big thing so that you don't take the time to really figure out what you want. Because the worst possible scenario is you wake up at 80 and say, oh my God. Absolutely. So I want to kind of keep going here. Can you kind of, kind of a flip side, you know, it's clearly, I think in, in coaching and what you do, you know, you have the, and I'll use air quotes here, the easy cases and the challenging cases. Um, can you just kind of talk about some of the difficult, you know, coaching situations that you've experienced, um, you know, in those clients and, you know, if there's anything, I kind of think, you know, everything, everyone's different, every situation is different. Um, but is there kind of any overlying, you know, commonalities there? And then kind of what's been the biggest challenge to getting people to kind of break through this pivot, um, you know, into the next, you know, 2.0, 3.0 that you've seen? I think the biggest challenge is getting, it is back to that quote from Henry Cloud, where the, the pain of staying the same isn't painful enough. Mm -hmm. And I also think it's when people should on themselves. So I should be doing something more. I should be uh, uh, getting paid more. I should be uh, in this sort of a role. I should be on a board. I should be this, you know, whatever the shoulds may be that may not be able to realize perhaps it's still back to the unreliable narrator of the not good enough as Ben talked about earlier. Those are the people that have the biggest challenge. I have found that in all the different types of coaching that I've done is the people who are able to take it in, digest it, whatever it is, and then make changes are the people that are able to move forward. The reality is, is that not everybody is able to pivot and get unstuck. Mm-hmm. I'm working with a client now that I'm not sure, frankly, um, where I usually work with people for an initial six month segment and then they decide if they want to continue on a month to month basis. Usually at the end of that six months, like the story I told you about the guy that that was laughing about what I wrote. He, you know, he, he's open to being vulnerable. He's open to, to becoming more self-aware. And so he could laugh about it. And that triggered him to get real clarity on, on what he wants to do next. Um, this other gentleman that I'm working with, I don't know. We're, we're at the same stage with less progress. Um, I think we've made progress in the self-awareness. I frankly don't think he it's time for him to pivot i Mm. think it's part of the story he's telling himself that he should interesting so what i've been trying to work with him on is recognizing and accepting what's good about where he is and he is very interested in, in adventure and encouraging him and when he drew his, his, his pie, the career one got smaller, not bigger. And yet he feels like he needs to focus on his career. And I keep reminding him of that yeah. and encouraging him to, to do some of the adventure things he wants to do, even if they start with a little one on a weekend or something like that. So he's had the weekend assignment the last two times we've met. I'm hoping by the next time I see him, he'll have done one of them. Um, so... Yeah, it's it's uh, it's not 100%. <laughs> and, and Elisa, I'm going to ask uh, cuz I think you you've covered a lot of my next question which I I wanted to go, but I'm going to I'm going to frame it a little bit differently. And one of the things that as we're going we're reading a lot of your blog and one of the things that you shared on on your blog was a Chinese proverb that said the the wise adapt themselves to circumstances as water molds itself to the pitcher. And we really like that and 
for the reason being that a, a consistent theme we're seeing across a lot of our episodes was that in lots of different areas of our lives as we age, I don't, it doesn't matter if you're going from two years old to five years old, um, or it's the you know middle or late stages of life, is that adaptability and flexibility are very important traits to have. That not getting set and and just digging your heels in on where we are today um, just leads to kind of this. Um, again, kind of it makes I think change harder. It can make uh, life harder at times. And in what you're, you're just kind of talking about was kind of helping people work through that and, and some of the factors you're seeing in terms of that resistance. So what, a, what one thing I wanted to say, because I think you just covered that really well, but I want to ask it a different way is, so sometimes it feels like, you know, you said the, the should on ourselves, but it, sometimes it feels like some people are should on us, is that sometimes you might feel that your your family is saying, you know, Ben, you know, you're getting older and it's time you should be moving into a different house or you should be you know, should be kind of connecting with these sorts of people and that we that other our network can start creating pressure of the things that they feel like we should be doing. And from their eyes that we're being resistant to change, but, you know, maybe for us that we don't need to change or how would you kind of help people coach through that? Right. Is it because, you know, first of all, is identifying them, but also these externalities creating these things of maybe I'm, I'm being forced to be something I don't want to be or do something I don't want to do because people tell me I should. Well, right. And that, or, or we think people are telling us back to, mm -hmm. back yep. to the, the wife in his head and the wife in the reality. I think there's two parts to this. One is um, the self-awareness and self-confidence, becoming aware of our saboteurs and our judgments of ourselves and getting real clarity on ourselves. That's the first part. Mm -hmm. And then if we can get there, then it's something we coaches encourage people to say is thank you for the feedback. I like it. That's really good. <laughs> Because we're, we're, we're the masters of our destiny, right? Is right. this is our life and this is, uh, we're in charge of that. And, yeah. you know, and, you know, sometimes it's, um, again, being able to be self-confident enough to say, Hey, no, this is what I want. And this is what I want to be. I understand why you're concerned for me, but you know, this is what I'm going to do. And again, maybe we're just not always kind of confident enough to be able to express that to each other. Well, and that's why the first part comes in of mm -hmm. getting clarity on who we are and what our strengths are and, our, and figuring out what our genius is so that we can build that confidence. Because really all of this comes down to that. And that comes from within. A coach can help us get in front of us what our strengths and our ultimate genius contributions are but that comes from within. All, all we can do as a coach is ask the better questions so that people can come to their own answers and challenge people on them. Sure. So again, my, my guy who was lying to himself about his accomplishments, we've now started talking about what his, his key offering and differentiators are and I've challenged him to so to make sure that it's it's available to him as well. So identify you know where he thinks his strengths are. Some of his strengths might fit better in the in the public company world, but he wants to work in privately held. So how mm -hmm. does he now narrow that down? Or the board example that I gave you earlier. Mm -hmm. So the the role of the coach is to help people bring it out of themselves. The difference between Coaching and teaching, I think, is an important point here, which is that a teacher tells me what, you know, teaches me something I don't know. Mm -hmm. Where a coach is, our job is to bring out what's within you. And in this sort of conversation and circumstance, it's about coaching. I can't teach you to feel confident about yourself. I can, I can coach you to identify where you bring value to the world, but you have to believe it and then act on it. And then when others say you should or shouldn't be doing this or that, thank you for the feedback. Mm -hmm. Thank I you like for it. hearing, appreciate the feedback. 
Um, so, Elisa, which I wish have... I'd had the maturity to, to do when I got those sort of things from my mother when I was, you know, when are you going to have kids or when are you going to get married or when are you going to do, you know, all these things you're supposed to do. <laughs> I wasn't as polite, <laughs> but that's really tough to do right in any one of our realms is because, you know, the people that we put on pedestals and that we really value their opinion, sometimes more than our own, it's, it's tough to then equalize your own opinion to them of no, I, I, I you know, this is what I want. And even though I, I'm used to getting steering guidance of what I should be and what I should do in my life. You know, now, again, the, I, I think for me as a, as a parent of a seven-year-old, you go, well, that's kind of what you want them to be as independent in their thinking and where they want to go and actualize their own dreams and not the dreams that I impose on him type thing. So I think those are important things to, to delineate. And I think that's, that's an important thing to say. Well, that's another self-awareness, too, because what, what commonly happens in these sort of situations is people who have um, the pleaser saboteur which all of our saboteurs come from our <laughs> and, and, and those of us in the service world often who are successful in the service world to have, have that characteristic. I was talking to a client about that yesterday. This kind of comparing CEOs in the service industry of financial, whatever services to um, manufacturing. So, knowing that about yourself and when it's time to start pleasing yourself versus always trying to please others. Gotcha. So here we are at the end of our conversation, Elisa. Um, and a lot of this conversation, you know, we've been talking about all the great work you do for other people and, you know, helping them achieve success and whatever, you know, pivot, whether it's 2.0, 3.0, 1.0. Um, so, I want to kind of flip the switch and, and focus on you for a second. Um, you know, the title of our podcast is the retirement success in Maine uh, podcast. And I know you're not in Maine, but you have been to Maine. So you fall into this category here. Um, so I really just want to ask you, how would you define, you know, retirement success for yourself? So for me, like many executives, my, vocation and avocation is is been my work I, my husband has hobbies that he can't wait to do when he retires um but for me it's my work and so i've thought about that a lot and i think my approach is similar to that to that client perhaps that's why that story was fresh that i was telling you about i want a, a blend of a bit of structure working with a handful of clients at any given time um, executives who i feel like for whom i can make a difference so to be selective about who I work with. And then the rest of the time, enjoying traveling with my husband and enjoying each day being outdoors, hiking and biking um, as much as I can, which I know somebody could do in Maine. So That's right. Maine That's is right. actually on, on, as soon as COVID is over, I want to take a bike trip there. It's, bike awesome. trips, so you're going to ride your bike. Are you going to ride your bike to Maine or are you going to get to Maine then <laughs> no, ride your bike? I think I'm going to get on an airplane. <laughs> feel comfortable doing that and then uh you know uh go with a bike company and nice nice, awesome. nice. been on my list for a while well, Elise, appreciate you sharing that story, but also all of your expertise with us today. It it really is um, it was really a treat to have you here uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what you do, but also some of the insights you have in terms of coaching and and things that I think our populations uh, I don't want to say struggles with, but they they work through all the time. And I think getting a little bit more of here's a service that's out there and and what you do specifically, I think helps uh, helps them that with that. So giving them a resource to go to, uh, we will of course, uh, uh, give a lot more resources to our audience uh, of yours in our blog post. We'll give you a little more uh, insight in that in a, in a couple of minutes, but appreciate you coming on and uh, hope to talk to you next time. Well, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. I, and your questions are very thoughtful. And I think this is a wonderful thing you're doing for your clients. And All right. Well, Lisa, thank you so much. We'll talk to you. It's so really excited to have Elisa K. Spain on the show today. I know Elisa has a really good niche there, right there with executives and, and people that really have that kind of mindset in terms of that, uh, the, the life pivots. So again, I like, I like that as a, as a theme was uh, thinking of it a little differently, not just retirement, but pivoting 
and kind of the process you kind of can go through to help identify a lot of that there. So again, we always like to wrap up a lot of our shows with lessons that we've learned from, uh, from our guests. Uh, love to have uh, Curtis maybe start off with uh, what, what you took away from today. Yeah. Um, you know, a piece of the, the conversation with Elisa that, that really stuck out to me was um, she brought it up when she brought up the analogy of a rose bush when she was talking to a client um, and the idea of, you know, every ending being also a new beginning or an opportunity for a new beginning and that the rose bush came into play with, you know, not only trimming the or pruning the, the dead wood of the, of the rose bush, but also trimming some of the roses as well. And that ability to keep growing and, you know, I guess, not honing in on the ending so much, but honing in on the idea that it, it's an opportunity for a new beginning. You know, so that, that piece really stuck out to me. Yeah. I, again, really, I really like that too, is because again, at the end of the day to get a really full rose bush is sometimes you do have to, um, you know, cut off some of the, the healthy parts of it. And mm-hmm. again, cause sometimes things just don't fit. And, and right. I think that was a, that was a really apt analogy that she kind of went to, to kind of help describe some of the process we're kind of all going through to, to yeah. kind of get to the next stage. Abby, in regards to your, um, your kind of outtakes from today, what was, what was something that stuck out to you? I thought it was interesting um, how she talked about how we should on ourselves. So um, expectations that, you know, others put on us or we put on themselves that feel like we need to be at a certain point in our lives by a certain age or um, stuff like that. And I, I know I personally do that and I found it very interesting kind of her perspective on the whole thing um, and how, how she coaches clients through that. And we hear that every day, right? Is even yeah. if, like in our own lives, um, the judgments we, right. we maybe sometimes give to others in our lives of, well, you're this age, you should be this or, right. you know, and you kind of have that as a, as that kind of uh, running uh, thought kind of coming through is like, you should be this and you should be that. I, I thought there was a kind of a neat way to put it, honestly, yeah. it was, yeah. was some, some way I'd never heard it kind of struck that way. And I, I thought that was a good way to frame it. Um, my own side, I, again, I, I really like the concept of the unreliable narrator. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think that's something where from a, a from something that we see a lot of, you know, that you're maybe you have a lot of skill and you've done really well, but you're really the first thing you point out is maybe the things you've not done well. Mm-hmm. And and by by kind of displaying those things, look, that's the thing you tell yourself, but that's also what you tell others. And, and how people think of you is sometimes the, the narrative that you, you give out. Uh, also, I'll, I'll share too, is I, I've actually done uh, or received kind of professional coaching on that side. And one of the things that was uh, kind of an outtake of that was, you know, the question I was asked from, from the process was the today story of, you know, what, how much of your day do you like doing mm-hmm. in terms of your work day? And how much do you think you should be enjoying of your work day? And when you start n- auditing your what your kind of your life that way and you start thinking about it and framing things a certain way you start getting to positive places and one things that was like well you know i always wanted to do uh, a podcast i always wanted to do these sorts of things mm-hmm. and then you look at the things you don't enjoy doing or really are not additive to the with the work you're doing and now you create space and now it, it frees up things to to get done so progress. And I, I kind of like that as an unreliable narrator of, well, we're not going to be good enough or no one will listen to us or, you know, this isn't something people uh, will, will kind of find note in. So we, we all struggle with that. Doesn't matter who you are, um, that that's something that's coming out, but realizing it's there and that discovery is, is pretty cool of something that she pointed out. So Elisa kind of gave us some really good uh, resources, some books uh, there. Yeah. She's got some really good blog posts. Mm-hmm. So we will be highlighting that in our, our own blog post, highlighting this show. Um, again, calling it uh, Thinking About Retirement as a Life Pivot. And if you go to our website, you can mm-hmm. uh, find more resources about this show. But um, if you uh, and if you have any questions or, or want to drop us a line, love to hear your feedback. Um, shoot uh, any one of us an email. Give us a call. Love to hear from you. And um, until then, we'll catch you next time.